Now uh, we are ready for the second panel of the day, uh, which is about the crisis in modern architecture. And leading the panel is Alexander Slatanos Ibsen. He is a political advisor for the Norwegian Conservative Party Høyre. He has a PhD in sociology and is a co-editor in the Minerva magazine. Please give him a warm hand. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for having this honor, really, of introducing a very distinguished panel on an incredibly important topic in, uh, in uh, let's call it the conservative movement, with, in, in, for everyone interested in pr the preservation of civilization. I think Mr. Erdenadrim did a terrific job in sort of uh, laying the groundwork as to where the, the debate is, is, uh, is moving, and uh, architecture is certainly one of those, one of those uh, areas. So we'll have, um, each of the panelists will have their own uh, presentation, first in, in, um, in a set order, and then we'll all enter the stage again and have a little discussion where it's also possible to, to have um, questions from, from the participants. So we'll do like that. It's going to be in, in the neighborhood of one hour and ten minutes. So our panelists, and, and they will give their uh, lecture in, in the order I, I am uh, naming them now. First it is uh, Karl Koschnes, who is a philosopher and editor-in-chief uh, in the, the Civilization magazine. Uh, the second one is uh, um, an architect, Erik Nurin from Sweden, is a founder of something called the uh, Architekturopropet, or, uh, or the, um, the architectural uproar, a phenomenon that has also taken root in Norway, incredibly interesting, and it is something new. It, is, it shows that you, know, you can have something, um, uh, a movement with traditionalist and conservative um, uh, motivation that, that really plays on the new technology and the new tools we have in the social media world. Uh, the last one is uh, Mr. Robert Adam. Um, he is, for years and years, he has been one of the most important exponents and proponents of traditional uh, architecture, uh, both with his own um, magnificent uh, drawings and buildings, but also, uh, as a true Brit, he is also a spectacularly good writer. Uh, so his books are, with this, highly recommended. So first, Karl Koschnes. Thank you. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. And uh, dear arrangers of this uh, conference, which really has been in the making for such a long time, uh, Fox, New Direction, and Roger Scruton Legacy, congratulations. And finally, the Nostos conference is a reality. You can truly be proud of yourself. And dear fellows in the panel, Mr. Ad uh, Mr. Adam, Mr. Ibsen, and Mr. Nurin, I look very much forward to our conversation. And dear audience, thank you so much for coming to a conference dedicated to philosophy and culture. There, there is hope. <laughs> My name is uh, Karl Koschnes, and I'm a philosopher and the editor of the culture magazine, um, Civilization. The motto of Civilization magazine is, beauty will save the world. This is a quote borrowed from Dostoevsky's character, Count Mishkin, but it could very well have been a quote from the man of the hour, Roger Scruton. Few philosophers of the last century have done more than Scruton to argue for the value of beauty. And therefore, the topic of this panel conversation is perfect for a conference in, him, in his honor, the crisis of modern architecture. And I think that central to this crisis is the loss of beauty. Of course, there are other philosophically valuable aspects of classical or traditional architecture, such as functioning as metaphors or creating a sense of belonging to a nation or a sense of belonging on this earth. But I do think that beauty is central, is a central philosophical value to classical architecture and even perhaps related to all the mentioned um, aspects. 
I must disappoint you that I, that I will not define beauty philosophically in a 12-minute talk. Uh, but I will sketch out a very possible brief notion of the term, drawing inspiration from a philosopher that I think presented a very good starting point. The ancient Roman architect Vitruvius, who wrote what is known as Ten Books on Architecture, which most of classical architecture theory is based upon today even, thought that a timeless notion of beauty could be learned from the truth of nature. That nature's design were based on universal laws of proportion and symmetry. In other words, beauty can be created, for instance, in buildings, by mirroring these natural laws of harmony. And from this starting point, we can argue that beauty consists of aspects such as harmony, symmetry, ornamentation, organic colors, repetition, figurative sculpturation, etc. There are not two lines under this definition, but it is a starting point for further uh, talk on the topic. However, um, I want to discuss the value of beauty. I think that's one of the parts that is missing in today's education within architecture and art. The valuation and defense of beauty. Uh, sometimes modernists can agree, actually, on what is beautiful. They just argue against the value of it. For instance, there are thinkers who would argue that the loss of beauty is just a result of development or progress, like that was something we did before. But what is progress? Doesn't progress mean that some, something gets better? And calling the loss of beauty for progress is actually a non-explanation, because nothing in the term progress includes such a criteria of getting rid of beauty. And then there is another um, uh, aspect that they can argue that beauty is just a matter of taste, something subjective. And, well, the understanding of beauty is indeed complex, but so are all great philosophical terms, such as uh, what is morally good or what is truth. So in sum, this is just an unphilosophical attitude to life, to just accept that the beautiful is purely subjective. And indeed, this, uh, this is, in my opinion, the way to restore the role of beauty, attempting to philosophically define beauty and its value, just like Scruton attempted. And back to the Roman architect and thinker Vitruvius. He argued that an architect should focus on three central teams when preparing a design for a building. Firmitas, utilitas, and venustas. Meaning strength, that it is solid, functionality, that it works the way it should, and beauty. If we ignore this last theme, beauty, we end up with what Scruton calls architecture of human need, which is often conceived uh, which often conceives the world as a world in which there are no values, but only animal needs. However, to quote Scruton, if you consider only utility, the thing you build will soon be useless. Nobody want, wants to be in it. And this is a very good quote. It's a great slogan, even. But it doesn't necessarily prove itself. Because, you see, people are still living in these ugly buildings that has become more and more grim for the last hundred plus years, as beauty has lost its role as a fundamental value in art and architecture. Of course, this can be explained through uh, societal issues such as norms, fashion, or just a good property market. My point is that we still need to discuss the question what is the value of revitalizing beauty as the central aspect of art and architecture? Then you can argue what beauty is, but what's the value of restoring its role? I would argue that surrounding oneself with beauty has the potential of contributing to human flourishing, to eudaimonia, 
This is a Greek term often quite wrongfully translated into happiness, but it's not a state of mind happiness, but it's a way of life. A more precise uh, but far from perfect translation is a contented, fulfilled, and flourishing life with added serenity and lots of activity. That's a mouthful in one term. So, beautiful architecture makes you happy and contributes to a meaningful life. Sounds good? There's a lot of scientific research that shows that classical architecture, which do consider beauty as a core value, makes people content, more relaxed, happier, and even more generous. However, all these scientific researches uh, is not enough for a philosophical explanation. We need to try to come closer to an explanation of what it is with beauty that can contribute to human flourishing, eudaimonia. And human, humans can flourish in two ways, Scruton argues. They can flourish as animals, getting what they need or desire, or they can flourish as rational beings. The fulfillment of a rational agent, eudaimonia, comes only when the agent has that which he values, as opposed to that which he merely desires. This is also the kind of uh, eudaimonia that Aristotle uh, 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 tries to defend. And Scruton, however, he argues that aesthetics and ethics are one when arguing for the taste within aesthetics. And on a similar note, Plato had an idea that beauty was not only an invitation to desire this essential, but also a call to renounce it. There comes the moral into it. I do see where this comes from, wanting to argue that aesthetics is something moral, that our experience of beauty is something more than animal, no, uh, an animal emotions. Yet, if beauty is mirroring the laws found in nature, as Vitruvius argued, is it not natural that our experience of it mirrors our experience of nature too? And on this one side, you can see uh, elements of architecture, uh, classical architecture, such as symmetry, ornamentation, and harmony. These are easily recognizable as elements that can be connected to a rational mind in order to be appreciated. But on another note, what about the elements that can be connected to experiencing beauty, beauty, such as being overwhelmed, moved emotionally, and finding pleasure, interested pleasure in the experience? Is the overwhelming experience and pleasure when seeing the Pantheon in Rome, the Red Square in Moscow, or the Putala Palace in Tibet, the result of only rational contemplation? This is an aspect that cannot be overlooked. So, defining beauty philosophically is indeed a tough task. On the one hand, if one argues that aesthetic judgments can be made, it is easy to conclude that the experience of beauty is disinterested and purely rational. On the other hand, if one argues it is linked to pleasure, it is easy to conclude that it appeals only to the animal parts of us, being almost banal, and perhaps even reduced to preferences or a matter of subjective choice. However, could there be a golden mean between these two? There is another, perhaps more nuanced, interpretation. Activities that awaken enjoyment or pleasure do not have to work contrary to the fulfillment of rational beings, eudaimonia. According to this view, the appreciation of beauty does not have to be disinterested in order to contribute to human fulfillment. And just to play with an idea here, let us, for the sake of argument, think of the experience of beauty as having some similarities to the experience of friendship. The differences between the two are obvious, but there might be some interesting similarities. And friendship is something that Aristotle, for instance, argues is essential to a meaningful life, to eudaimonia. So now we have this experience of friendship, experience of beauty. 
Doesn't both of these experiences awake a sense of enjoyment, i.e. not being purely rational? Although true friendship is not a relation built solely on desire, not at all, it is built on mutual respect and wishing each other well. I think one can agree that it awakens some kind of pleasure to reach a state of true friendship. And doesn't both activities relate to a love for something outside oneself? Yet an essential part of being human, and then respectively love for another person, or a love for nature, this is if we regard beauty as um, laws of proportion and symmetry existing in nature. And lastly, doesn't the appreciation or enjoyment of both activities increase the higher quality it has? There are shallow friends, friendships and shallow beauty. And then you have the kinds that change your life to the better. Yet, despite these qualities appealing to other aspects than purely rational side of man, both activities can be regarded as contributing to a fulfilled life. To sum up in a very straightforward way, the fact that eudaimonia means human fulfillment of a rational agent ought not to include a devaluation of all aspects of human pleasure and interest. Yes, you can learn to differentiate between levels of beauty and rank the more complex levels of beauty. What can be called taste. Just like um, you with experience and knowledge can achieve a taste within wine or within friendship, learning the difficult task of singling out true friendship. However, that does not make wine tasting or friendship purely rational activities. You do not need to rationalize in order to experience beauty. If you argue in favor of that, you risk having an intangible definition of beauty, as intangible as ugly modernism, which only those with the right education can understand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. And uh, so uh, the organizers briefed me that I misunderstood. We were supposed to sit at the, uh, on stage uh, from this moment on. So I'll just invite the, uh, um, Mr. Adam and Mr. Noreen to, to enter the stage. And Noreen, of course, so it's, uh, it's uh, your time to give your, your words. Thank you. Uh, can I please get my presentation on, on the screen? Yes. Um, I'll just jump right to it. This is an observation. When I tried to book my airplane ticket to get to Oslo, this is what they showed me. <laughs> Take a moment and look at these pictures, please. And look at the text. Look at what they're trying to tell us on the booking site of Norwegian. To me, the first thing that popped to mind was this. <laughs> yes, uh, so first of all, I'm honored to be here, especially taking part of a panel together with Carl, who did a great interview with a close friend of mine from Architecture Uprising, and uh, an idol of mine, it is, truly. So uh, thanks a lot. And uh, the crisis of modern architecture, a subject in this room when Scruton is at least present with his ideas, and these very fine people, I thought, what could I contribute with? What could I do? And I realized, in a way, my young life has been living in the crisis. So the best thing I could do to contribute to this was probably to tell you my story. And not just to tell you about myself, but because I realized that my story is sadly very common for people who like classical architecture. It's, it's in some way stereotypical. So I will try to take you through it. I was born in the north of Sweden in a town called Sundsvall, not in 1887, of course, but <laughs> everyone in my hometown from a very young age is told one story, and it's the story of our town. It used to be a very small town, not important at all, but in a very hot summer day in 1888, it all burnt down. This was a 
greatest fire catastrophe in Swedish history. 11,000 people lost their homes in a day. But because it was a town with great insurance and very smart people, they decided to rebuild it. So, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, in just a few years, probably the last city in Europe if you walk from the south to the north, or the first European continental city coming from the north. It's like being in the center of Paris or in Vienna or whatever. It's the town I grew up in. It's the town I learned to love uh, a lot. So growing up in this, a place like this, I realized quite early that when my friends referred to meeting places, like just outside this store or outside this restaurant, I usually didn't know where this was. Because when I arranged a meeting, I said, could we meet just below those two angels on top of a tower? Because I loved this. I, I didn't see the store signs, I, I just saw the architecture, and I fell in love with it. So from an early age, I tried to study it, and I fell across this man. He's called Gustav Hermansson, and he drew almost all the buildings after the fire. And I just studied him a lot, from a young age until I was 18 at least. I ordered copies of his drawings to hang in my room, and just liked everything he gave my hometown. He made my hometown, in a way. So I wanted to be like him. I dreamt of becoming an architect. I fell in love with his story. And Hermansson, like most Swedish architects, went to the Royal Institute of Technology, the Golden Letters, the place everyone wanted to go to, this place. So I studied hard to get into architecture school, and this is what I dreamt of. I wanted to become like him. I wanted to learn how to design beauty. How do you do it? What's behind it? And you know what? This is where I ended up. <laughs> this is the Royal Institute of Architecture. And as disappointed I was of the building, I got angry because nothing of what I expected was to be found. This is not an education. This is not a school. It's a center for brainwashing students to become modernists. Sadly, Nothing of what I wanted to learn in architecture was to be found in this building. Nothing. Then we get to here, because this is a modernist building in Sweden, of course it was leaking, it was cold, it rained in, so we had to move. So they told us, you're going to move up to campus. And I thought, yes, finally, being this beautiful building, coming up to the real campus. You know what? <laughs> so I spent five years in these two bunkers, one in rust and one in concrete. And the only thing I could do was try to do the least to pass my courses and just try to get my architecture diploma and walk away, because I wasn't interested at all in what I did in there. I only studied people like Robert Adam and other classicists active. So I did minimum in school, tried to pass, and walked on. But if you're my age and you're angry about something, what do you do? You complain on social media. <laughs> and you know what? I found other people just like me. And that resulted in starting the organization Architecture Uprising. So what we do is really simple. We promote new classical architecture, and we work to preserve, defend, and teach people about the cultural her heritage we already have. And today we're about 65,000 members, and it all started in 2014. So what do we do then? We mock modernism. That's what we do. <laughs> Which postcard will you send? <laughs> or would you like a box or a castle? It's the same price tag. <laughs> Fake view. It's probably a word that we invented. So normally when an architect wants to do something, they make a rendering, a computer drawing, a picture showing this is how it's supposed to look. And then we take a picture of the building, how it actually looks, and just compare those two. The funny thing is, the one on top was prized best building of the year by the Swedish Architecture Association. You know what? Our members voted it the ugliest. So what we do is we mock things, we make debate, and we try to put the subject of city planning, architecture, and lack of classicism onto every conversation possible. This is top 100 voted ugliest buildings and most beautiful buildings. Could you guess which one is which? <laughs> Our greatest victory was actually quite recent, when the Nobel Foundation, 
the guys giving out the Nobel Prizes, wanted to extend and have their own Nobel Center in Stockholm. And uh, David Chipperfield won this competition when they had to choose from five different modernist boxes. And uh, we just made this postcard. Thank you, no thank you. Greetings from Stockholm, because it looks like a golden container. And because this created so much debate, even the king, who lives close by, said, maybe this isn't the greatest idea. And what happened was the leader of the Conservative Party said this. This is something you could lose an election from. And this is the areas, probably the wealthiest areas in all of Stockholm, just close by, the people who have a view over this place. And the Conservative Party lost 50% of their support in these areas because they supported this construction. So what happened is this debate is just growing and growing and growing. Everyone's talking about it. And five years ago, that wasn't the case. So, Architecturupprovet, or Architecture Rebellion, is just growing and growing and growing. But one has to say, what we do is nothing new. Not at all. This is a painting, or a, it's a comic strip from 1930. It says, so, uh, your son is working in a box factory. Yeah, he's becoming an architect. <laughs> and this is from the 1930s. So what we do is nothing new. What's new is we brought it to social media. So instead of having this one-way conversation through like old medias, we're creating a living organism, which is the architecture uprising. It's growing a lot. Uh, together, it's all already 200,000 members. Strongest nation today is actually Norway, so thanks a lot for that. But we exist in these countries and uh, starting up in several more. So we're aiming to become 10 active countries uh, quite soon. So it's fantastic. It's just growing and growing and growing. And I have to say, I'm extremely grateful for this and surprised in a positive way, because not in my dreams could I think that when I was alone and angry in architecture school, that posting some angry things on Facebook would result in this. Hundreds of thousands of people saying the same thing, debating, and actually starting to get their voices heard. But you know what? While this success was going on, I was still in here. So, uh, in a way, I felt locked in. I couldn't do anything. But I had a guardian angel, and that was Engelsberg, my first proper education. I had the chance to be part of Intbau Summer School. For one month, four weeks, I had to live in this house. Top window to the right. I loved it. It's the best thing that ever happened in my career. I, I, I think I learned more during those weeks than I did throughout architecture education. This was the thing that actually made me realize that I can do this. Because no one else has knowledge of this. I was the only one coming back to architecture school knowing these things. It made me grow as a person, it made me grow as an architect, and realizing that now at least I have the basics, the first step of maybe doing this. And uh, as you can see, Robert was one of the tutors. Thanks a lot for that, meant a lot. So I realized, because what I've said in social media, in the news, and TV, and radio, uh, no one wanted to hire me. I was unhirable, because most practicing architects in Sweden are modernists, and I'm not. So uh, what to do? Of course, I had to start my own firm, and I did, and I named it Tradition. So, this building was finished some months ago. We actually won the Design Award of the Year for it. Uh, some details. To me, it's at least Northlandic vernacular. It's a celebration to the first industry. Private house outside of Stockholm, almost finished. Some details. So I'm not showing this just to promote who I am. I'm showing it just to say it's possible, and I'm trying to do it. So this is what I'm working on. But what happened was that, for the first time, we had many victories in architecture uprising, but people in politics called and said, you know what, most of people voting on us like classical architecture. So we're thinking, we maybe could put that on our party agenda and say, yeah, our party is for this. So the Conservative Party asked us, this area in a very boring modernist suburb north of Stockholm, could we do something with it? So they arranged a competition. This is what I drew for it. 
and uh, it's coming up. We're not sure. Sadly, my firm was not the winner, but a friend of mine won. So what happened was, for the first time, people of politics took our side in the debate. So instead of just being traditionally in interested people in the architecture uprising against active modernist architects, we also got the politics on our side. Because people now realized, this is me uh, debating the most famous modernist in the largest debate program in Sweden, but they realized that this is something you can win an election on. People want this. So every survey done after this, both by Oikos and statistically surveys, show that 70, 80, 90 percent of Swedes want this. They even want their people in politics to decide for them that classical architecture, traditional architecture, should be the norm. Then, just finish here. My greatest fear. In the architecture magazine of Sweden, this was under the headline of New Traditional Architecture. And to me, this designer, in terms of classical architecture, is if this designer was a doctor, he would probably kill people. <laughs> this is not traditional ar architecture at all. This is just someone who doesn't know anything about traditional architecture, putting it together like a children's puzzle. It's so disrespectful. So what I'm really afraid of is things like this being sold as classical architecture. So we have a problem now a problem I couldn't even dream of some years ago, that the public opinion, politics, is actually wanting classical architecture. There's a demand for it, but there's no one who knows how to do it. So now my greatest fear is actually that we'll end up with things like this being called classical. So we have no, no one to actually do it. So back again to the school. I had a conversation with a friend who's, who runs a very big modernist office. He said, the school system has let us down because the architects coming from the schools doesn't know anything. So they let us down as a company. And I said, is that how you look upon it? Doesn't your nose go further? Because it's not you as a company who they let down. Because I don't care if your company goes bankrupt. If we don't have architects that could produce architecture, that would be loved and taken care of for the next and next and next generation. Buildings tend to stand for hundreds of years. It's not your company they let down, it's our future generations. We have nothing to offer them in terms of what we already know people want. So, I would say the major crisis in modern architecture, the major problem right now, because we already won the debate, who is going to do it? We need to fix the schools. We need to have proper education. We, more, we need more things like Engelsberg School. So hopefully, Leon Krier were right in the 1980s that this modernist thing is probably just a short thing, and we'll see in 2030 where things are. And I just want to finish on this quote, and I think it's fantastic. Tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. Thank you. Um, as, for, as for heroes, I've just, um, I've just uh, swapped, swapped positions here. I think Eric is now my hero. Um, so I'm, I, too, am going to use slides, and I'm going to move straight on because time is short. And that's the forward. Yes. And, of course, I'm going to start uh, with a quotation from Roger Scruton. And initially, what I'm going to talk about is tradition. Um, I call myself a traditional architect. I mean, some people call me a classical architect, but all classical architecture is traditional, but not all traditional architecture is classical. We're, we, can, we can play with the name tradition and classical for a long time, but don't let's bother. Um, so I'm going to talk about tradition. Uh, I mean, a fundamental concept, and as, as Roger fully recognized. Um, tradition is, is our social memory. It's, it's, it's the way we remember socially, but socially in a whole series of different ranges. It, it's, it's, um, uh, it's sometimes it's a country, sometimes it's, a, it's political, the middle, top middle side is political. It could be do with academics, it, uh, um, academics. Uh, and of course, it's very often connected with important ceremonies in life. 
And so we have a, we have a Japanese wedding and an Indian wedding. Um, uh, and so this is what this uh, our social memory. It's our social memory, our memory as groups of people um, that gives us our identity. I mean, I don't have time, but each one of these has an amusing story, but I'll, I'll, uh, that's for another time. Um, of course, a lot, a lot of, uh, particularly a man called uh, Eric Hobsbawm, produced a book called In the Invention of Tradition, which has been used to mock tradition, saying, oh, well, it's just going to be invented. You know, it's just a fake. And of course, he was a communist, so actually he believed it was a means of elites um, um, terrorizing um, poor people who were fooled by this. Because people aren't, what he did got wrong was that actually people, people do invent traditions, and they're successful, and that demonstrates their power. And I'll go into how they can be identified in a minute. So they can be amplified. The, the top is the left is the festival of, of San Fermin in Pamplona and the Chupinazo, which is being showed here. This is a centuries old one. It was added in 1941, and it's just been amplified. Um, the kilt at the bottom, which was actually um, one of the examples of an invention, um, that's called the Tartan Army, which um, terrorizes most football matches. Um, uh, it, it's, it, has a, it has a convincing ancestry, and I'll get to that. Um, it doesn't really matter if bits of it were invented. It is actually part of Scottish identity, even if Scotsmen who, whose families never wore a kilt ever um, and have now adopted it. But, of course, you can fail. Top right is the, um, uh, is the President's White House Guard, invented by President Nixon. I wanted to find one that went wrong. It was, it was, uh, everyone laughed so much they had to politely remove it, and it ended up as the um, Ohio Second Marching Band they sold the uniforms. The reason was it had no convincing ancestry. Whereas at the bottom, we have the European Court of Human Rights, um, which came into existence in 1959. Uh, but they wear the robes of a 17th, 16th or 17th century academic or, or cleric. Uh, no one laughs at that, though they appear to be amused. Um, no one laughs at that and took it away, because it, it, it's connected with a convincing ancestry. Um, and. These are very, these additions of additions are very, very by his Fete Nationale or Bastille Day, um, brought into existence in 1879. Actually, Bastille, so the siege of the Bastille was 1789. Still very, very important for, um, for French national identity. I mean, I can talk about the uniforms later. And the Toll Puddles Martyr, the, the, the great celebration of the left in Britain. Um, the Toll Puddles were taken off to Australia in 1834 for being unionists but they were first called martyrs in 1930. And this is now still a central tradition for the British Socialist Movement. So these are, tradition is a complex issue. Um, and because of its complexity, it's sometimes derided. But I want to get to three core things, I think, about tradition. Um, one is it has to have ancestry. And I put the words, you can read at the bottom, convincing. That it actually have to be precise. People have to believe in them. So Palladio on the left, um, he actually believed that um, Roman houses had porticos. They didn't. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, he actually believed that. And it be it, it's become an established tradition. Um, the Fisherman's Bastion in Budapest, very, very typical of, um, uh, of National Romanticism, uh, 1902, it, it has a, a convincing uh, ancestry. And on the right, a building by George Samuel Smith, a, similarly a classical building. So one key thing is it has to have a convincing ancestry. Now, of course, we all have traditions, and of course, so do these. Um, uh, on the right is the uh, top right is the uh, Gropius's um, um, uh, master's house from the 19, uh, 1930s, and, and on the left is Bin House in Ho Chi Minh City. It's very clear that the architect, who, uh, whose name I can't pronounce, who, um, who designed that, knew about the one on the right. On the left. Uh, is Muller Architects in for a project in Copenhagen. I, I've absolutely no doubt they knew about Mies van der Rohe's project. The point about, the, about this is that this is an ancestry to this particular group. So they clearly operate on a tradition, but that ancestry is specific to that group. Um, the other one um, is community identity. Uh, I, I think this is a real fundamental. Um, so on the top, uh, we have a Hindu temple in the uh, British Midlands town of Nottingham, where there are a large number of people uh, of, of, of who are, are practicing Hindus. And that architecture gives that community that particular identity. In fact, it's attached to an old military drill hall. It doesn't matter. 
That's very important. And on the bottom, we have Duncan Stroik's Thomas Aquinas College Chapel in San Paolo, California, 2009. The, the, that, the connection with, um, with uh, Catholic buildings in Europe well, is very clear and very clearly expressed. So, I mean, this can go on and on, but uh, these are very obvious examples of the significance of tradition com community identity. And, of course, this community also has an identity. Um, every, everyone who is trained as an architect knows that if you produce a building that looks rather like a shoebox and has glass down one side, you will probably get an award. Um, <laughs> And uh, that, I, I make that as a joke, but it's absolutely serious. Um, uh, and so there is a, everyone knows that, that in the building at the bottom is, in fact, a facsimile um, from 1986 of a building from 1928. It seems it's all right to do facsimiles of modernist buildings, but not all right to do other facsimiles. Um, and all of these other buildings are clearly related. Every architect understands that. So that community of architects who award things to one another in this closed group, they have a, they have a very clear community identity. The other thing is it has to be identifiable. Um, I, I, a well-known modernist architect once said to me, I do tradition too, but it's hidden. And I said, I'm sorry, this is a contradiction in terms. You can't have a hidden tradition because it's not a tradition. Um, and so here, I mean, this is a building that I have one of my colleagues, by Hugh Petter, and actually it's a cricket pavilion, but in fact it was commissioned by the Prince of Wales, and so the column capitals have the Prince of Wales' um, Feathers on them, his coat of arms, and a little urns on the top are a thing called the ashes. This is very British. I won't go into too much detail. On the right is a building I designed in Beirut. I think it's still there. Um, uh, with, a Beirut, with a Beiruti architect. Um, and uh, there are very specific aspects of this that, that, that identify uh, with Lebanese architecture and, and Middle Eastern architecture. So the, the, the identity there is very, very clear. So those are, in my opinion, the three key characteristics. Um, and of course, if you want to be, if you want to, um, uh, uh, to make something identifiable, these are identifiably, um, I use the word carefully, contemporary buildings. Um, you, any architect would recognize these as, 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 a, as identifying a particular architectural movement, one by Zaha Hadid, another one in Tokyo. So the key point of this is that we all have traditions, but this gives us a critical basis um, for talking about tradition is I mean, most modernists do now admit they have traditions, and you know they're not stupid, um, and they and of course they use it as justification. But if a community, if tradition is about community identity, which community is it for? If it is just for a small group of people who trained at buildings such as Eric um, showed us, um, um, then that's fine. That's a community, but actually that's just for them. It's very difficult. Uh, an architect would not actually admit it generally to say, "Well, I'm just doing this for my friends." Uh, my mates, so to speak, um, they, they believe, they, they, they've got to say they're doing it for community. They say, well, fine, well, what community identifies with what you're doing? And I just think there's a different critical basis. I think it's a useful critical basis um, for dealing with this, 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 what they call this architectural problem. And architecture, Uproet, is fantastic because it's actually identified this with absolute clarity. There are things happening in Britain, but that, that's a bit more complicated. I'm just going to, I have to be brief, I'm going to finish with the issue of conservatism. Um, and I think this is actually quite an important point, uh, because we're often criticised um, by those who oppose us um, for just returning to the past. People say, I design with a quill pen, or um, I, um, you know, do I drive a car, and things like that. Uh, I have an answer to this. I, I tell them that um, I woke up this morning and discovered I was in the 21st century, and there was nothing I could do about it, which meant that everything I did was a 21st century thing, everything I thought, the 21st century thought. And they don't know what to say with that one. I've, I've, I've honed these arguments down. But I think it's important when we look, at, and I think this goes back to tradition, is that tradition is a living phenomenon. It's not static. It's something that keeps on developing. And this is actually a debate within the traditional architectural community. And I'm going to use my own buildings just in, simply in order to promote them. Um, uh, to just draw this point out, uh, I mean, I have, very often I have clients who say, I want a building that's very like an 18th century building. And I can do that. It's not a problem. I can do it. And in fact, these are, these are examples of two buildings I've designed, which um, one, is, um, uh, 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 one is very like a, a sort of romantic uh, early 19th century building. Was, that's fine. I can do that. It's not a problem. There, there are, there's little bits of invention in that. I think the thing that probably interests me a bit more and um, here we have buildings, one's an office block in London, and another says a large house, where you, you're, you're working with a vocabulary. You know, I, I'm speaking in English. Thank you very much for 
I'm doing everything in English. Um, uh, that means that I can continue to develop my language and adjust it uh, with new things. But it's still the same language, broadly, that Shakespeare spoke. So, um, I say broadly. But, um, uh, so, that idea that you can carry on, and this is a debate within, the architect, within, within traditional architects, actually. Uh, you know, the idea that, you know, some people criticize me very strongly for not having, for, for the window types on these, and so on and so on. Not very many, but some do. And then the next one is when actually you take it to the next stage where the, the, you know, the level of invention moves on. These are quite rare. Clients very rarely ask for this kind of thing. So they're, they're interesting opportunities. The one on the left is a millennial pavilion where I was commissioned to do something which was classical but could only have been done at the turn of the millennium, and it's another story. So I think that tradition and the idea of, 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 of conservatism, it, it, I, I, there's a critical basis here. The critical basis for tradition is which community and the idea that somehow in tradition we're trying to fix the past is not true. That's a misunderstanding of traditions. Traditions are living phenomena, and that's what makes them important. And if you really want to, you can go buy my book and read much more about it. Uh, I've left a copy out there if you want to have a look at it. And uh, there's another book there with a, a forward by Roger Scruton. So if nobody's stolen them over coffee, um, do have a look at them. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to all three um, for inspiring uh, words. And um, we have time for, uh, for a little session. And uh, please notify if you have a question for uh, one or many members of the, uh, in the panel. I will, uh, time is short, so I will have uh, one, one sort of over, overarching question to each of the, of the um, uh, panelists. So we'll start with that. And uh, Carl. So you, you mentioned Vitruvius and the, um, the three legs of uh, architecture and devoted a substantial amount of your time to, to discussing beauty. But still, that is also a, a topic that is very easy to make fun of. So how do you respond when, when, you, when you justify uh, beauty as an aspect of, of uh, art and architecture? Uh, what do you respond when you're being made fun of for that? I... Uh I often respond uh, as that we should have the discussion on what beauty is. And that relates a bit to what uh, Eric was talking about in the end of his talk, that the education is so important. And so when people make fun of uh, beauty, that that ought to be a criteria, then I'd rather try to answer with, well, but what do you define as beauty? And why do you think that it's not important? And try to actually have a debate about it. And my experience is that often it is uh, made into, uh, it's a relativist uh, response. That, well, uh, it's both uh, the term that your grandmother liked it, and therefore it's uh, uh, kitsch, or it's uh, something that you can make fun of. And then, if you try to argue against that, then comes the relativistic that, well, okay, but that's your opinion on what beauty is. But that's relative. And I think that's a very unphilosophical attitude that one ought to try to define what it is. And then it often comes forth that, well, but there are some aspects that you actually um, do appreciate that can be defined as a kind of beauty. And then we reach some place. So, uh, basically, it's, they're trying to make it a dead end, but uh, I think it's a, a good idea to refuse that it is a dead end, to say, like, no, that's, that's not a... Somewhat related to that, though, Carl, you have the, let's call it modernist argument, even though it's not entirely, you know, um, um, uh, it, it takes, takes hold outside of what we would call modernism also, but sort of a zeitgeist argument that... You, d that people who want to preserve, they, they are ignorant to the fact that we should have development, there should be fashion, there should be uh, changes in, in also beauty, because beauty in the sense you talk about is more of the, I suppose, the timeless quality. Uh, so, so do we need that? Is, is there something to the zeitgeist argument that we need fashion and involvement? Yeah, but not, not in that, that sense. And it's actually, uh, it often works with just the same argument that um, 
I would say nine out of 10 that comes with a zeitgeist argument that that is something we did before, uh, as uh, uh, Robert Adam was talking about, that uh, being conservative is just uh, to, to want to live in the past. That's not the case. And uh, when with the zeitgeist argument, nine out of 10 just have the notion because they have heard it. When you try to actually make an argument for it, when you uh, demand that they argue for it, why it is the case, it's very few people that can argue why it should be the case. And then you have reached somewhere and you get a discussion. Could I just add on to that? Absolutely. I would say, like, in my experience, the best argument when met with criticism of what beauty is, is just to say, but look at democracy. What do people want? Because everywhere, at least in the Western world, 70, 80, 90% actually want this. And the same thing with zeitgeist. What is not of our time, but what people want? I could, I could add to this too. I mean, this is actually very, the word beauty is particularly relevant in relation to Roger because Roger um, chaired um, until he was uh, scandalously removed and then t took back again before he died uh, the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission in the UK, which is now being translated into, into regulation. Very interesting, long subject, now it's not the time. But the, oh, this one came up all the time. And there's a saying in Britain, I don't know where it came from actually, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And this is always rolled out. But it's relative. It doesn't really matter because you might find something beautiful. And I, I know my children don't think things I think beautiful are, but uh, there you go. And so we now, well, now the problem in Britain is, is that they're trying to actually turn it into regulation. And this is very tricky because there's a lot of people who have this sort of view that well, it's, it's kind of, you know, whatever you want, isn't it really? It's whatever you think personally. But it's, I, and I, I, and so what, what it's actually coming to is what most people in a community believe is beautiful. And that's, in a legal sense, that's, that's quite, you can deal with that, because you can actually ask them. Um, and it will change, of course it will change. The thing called the shadow of taste, you know, it, it, it just does. I mean, one can try and highlight very particular things like rhythm or, or symmetry and so on, which are, you know, are, are, are broadly there in most things that we can, we can, can need to be beautiful. But in Britain, we now have got, that we're moving, I'm involved with this, to producing codes which are based on what is provably popular. And that's where they've got to. So I, I, as I say, I, this, is, this one is very, very current. And of course, all the architecture professions say, well, the other thing they say is, well, um, buildings that people used to think were really ugly, they're now quite like. Well, you can't really base something on a speculative future. <laughs> which takes me to the zeitgeist argument, uh, which I think is a rather important one, because it's actually an, it's an historical theory. It's this theory that, and I think it's made up by historians, forgive all historians in the audience, um, is that if, when you study history, very often you discover those things that are different in each period. You define your period by what's particular to that period, not so much by what the things that continue. So you begin to believe that the only thing that matters about a period is that thing which is specifically different from the other periods. You then, the next stage is you believe the only way to be authentic, dangerous word authentic, the only way to be authentic to your period is to be completely different. And this sets up a, a, sort, of, um, a, a sort of burden on, on architects who believe this, is they keep on having to be different just to be, to use a very common phrase, of their time. Um, and I believe this is a fallacious historical theory. The things that really matter in our lives don't change very much. Our relationships between one another, um, our, 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 you know, our society, our happiness, these are really, really important things. They don't really change. You read any, anything from the far past, you'll find those things in there. But this is, I believe that this, this idea of the zeitgeist or continuous progression is a fallacious um, theory derived from history, from historical study. Very, very good observations. I have uh, also a question for, for Eric. And uh, that has, you, you, it was very interesting to see your, your, the, the worst, your worst fears and nightmares for, the, for a traditionalist movement is sort of a, a half ironic pastiche of, or bad exponers, right? So, so exponents who are not well adapted at, at the current period. I, I guess most architects who devote themselves to this, to, to, to vernacular and traditional architecture are very good because they have to pass some hurdles. Uh, if the movement get, gains momentum, then you will have poor architects, bad architects also. I was wondering about another fear, and it might not be something we need to consider, but we live in an age where uh, we have an anti-populist panic, 
I would say, for, for both good and not so good reasons, but it's certainly a part of the age. And at one time, the modernist movement, when it was uh, new and fresh, it had, was full of fire and, and had um, uh, confidence and believed in itself, moving away from the past and away from the oil lamp and liberating the masses. That, of course, is gone. We're just left with the same architecture without the ideology. Might, and also you have other ambassadors for classical architecture who are bad ambassadors. Um, half of the authoritarian leaders around the world love Greek columns. <laughs> just, it's just how it is. Is that something we need to consider, both the populist panic and, and, and the bad ambassadors in general for vernacular style? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, just to clarify one thing which is quite important in this conversation. You mentioned that in the beginning of modernism, in the beginning of functionalism, where you know, freeing the masses from the lack of electricity and you know, everything, the first modernists went through classical school. They knew classical architecture, they knew proportions, they knew everything. They were highly skilled in their field. And because of that, they could use a lot of that knowledge, a lot of that education into creating quite good buildings. I would personally agree that the best modernist buildings are the first ones. The problem is, this, this is five, six generations ago. So since then, we lost it. We don't have the same kind of educational basis for it. That's why the first modernist movement got on so good with politics and with development of the world after the wars. So absolutely. But you mentioned fear of populism. Um, I guess it's the right room to say it, but a very famous politician said in the European Parliament after a referendum that you could say whatever you want about populism, but it's becoming quite popular. <laughs> so in a way, I'm not afraid at all to be called a populist because... In a, yeah, it means people actually Have like you what you do. The populist? I've been called a lot of ugly things. Oh, and worse. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, absolutely. But it, it's a thing we have to tackle, of course. But the goal is not to be right now active popular. The goal is to make sure that our grandchildren inherit something from us that they could be proud of. Mm. So, I, I think the perspective is so much longer. So, I could just wave away the, the populist argument because I, I, I'm not affected at, of it at all. And then, in terms of lack of competence, when something is so popular, people actually crave it. When it's clearly shown in statistical studies and in politics, people want this, market want this. People tend to pay a lot more money for traditional buildings than modernist ones. So, I, I, I am, for, for, for real, this is what I'm afraid of, that we will have too few architects and designers and builders who actually know what traditional architecture is for real. So we will end up in some kind of pseudo reality where people who don't really know anything about it try to produce it. It's like when you ask a child to do a pizza and they serve you a pancake with ketchup on it. It's like, it's a pizza. No, it's not a pizza, like, come on. But if they tell enough people that this is a pizza, then we'll end up with a society where people actually think that the best Italian pizza is a Swedish pancake. And th th I'm really afraid of that. Yeah. And it already happened to some extent during the postmodern era. Yeah, I'm sure you're right about that. Also, an, an example from a very short distance away from here, you have the, uh, the, uh, the cathedral, the, the, the church of Oslo, uh, which they renovated a couple of years ago. Uh, and in the dome, they needed to, to do something with the beams, and it was an intricate system. And they discovered there was not a single craftsman in Norway who was able to do it. They went to northern Sweden and found some few remaining people who understood the intricacies of that. So that, I guess, can apply to most areas of, of craftsmanship. and uh, Absolutely, and that's also one of the things we're fighting for in Architecture Uprising, that we need to make sure that we take care... Like oh, um, <coughs> you other mentioned with the Norwegian theater, if we don't take care of what we inherited, then we, after just one generation, we will lose the knowledge of how to take care of them. So we need the craftsmanships, and especially if we don't take care of what we already have, who are we, like, who's, who's going to do it in the next... So, if, I yeah. if I can follow Eric, just for a moment, because 100% on, and it's well recognized in Britain, that the biggest threat to traditional architecture is not modernism, it's bad traditional architecture. Right. In fact, the, the housing industry recognizes absolutely yeah. that people want traditional buildings. The housing industry is a commercial organization. Basically, if, if that's what people want, they'll give it to them, but they often give it to them very, very badly. Um, 
And the one about early modernists, I would also agree, it was the thing that took me into tradition. In early days when I gave lectures, I got kind of standard responses, you know. I could, I could write them out. And one of them was, was called the Mies van der Rohe question. And it was, surely, Mr. Adam, um, uh, Mies van der Rohe was a true inheritor of the classical tradition. Right. In a funny way, he was. He actually believed he was. But I said, well, no, I realized that the thing about a tradition is that it means that if you think you are, you need to hand it on to somebody such that they know what its origins were. And that failed. Yep. And so as a result of that, it wasn't a tradition. That was, that was what took me into whole analysis of tradition. That's interesting. And also, um, uh, Robert, when you, uh, you mentioned briefly Scruton, and uh, Roger Scruton wrote on architecture, and also you mentioned that the, 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 the strange and how... So the situation where he was dispelled from the Housing Commission because of some, something he said in an interview on a completely unrelated topic. It was one of the early instances of cancel, cancel culture, really. Well, it, I mean, it's a long story and it's quite well published, but it was an absolute scandal. Yeah. Uh, it, was a, it was a fixed interview. Um, the extracts were produced. He was sacked without ever being asked if it was true by the government. Someone then leaked the full transcript um, I don't know who it was. I don't know if anyone ever knew who it was. No, but I think Murray. Douglas Murray was... Oh, yeah, and it, that, that actually revealed yeah. how false that had been. The editor had to resign, and he was reinstated. By that time, the committee had been taken over by Nicholas Boyd Smith, who is a, a significant ally, who is now still working on it, and they then became joint, and, and to all of our great regret, Roger died. Um, and it's fan but his legacy exists not only in organizations like this, but his legacy actually currently exists in the British planning system. Yes, so that, that was my point. This is one of the areas he wrote, so Roger Scruton wrote on any, so a, a huge array of topics, as you all here know, and I, th I guess it is fair to say that architecture is one of the areas where he had uh, a lasting impact, or we can see it already that it is there. I think his book, uh, the first book was from the 70s, and he, he there makes an argument that you need to think of it as some, uh, some form of, it's, it's kind of the functionality sets it apart from other art forms and that you need to have this kind of everyday aesthetical appreciation of it. Is, is that... Uh, yes, I mean, effectively, um, there's, there's, there's those who, who present it as solely fine art. Yeah. And therefore, you know, it's, it's just entirely the responsibility of the artist. Do. And that's a very common view out there. Some of the buildings that Eric showed were exactly that. I am an artist, therefore I have the right to put on whatever my temporary inspiration is on you. But it is a community matter. Yep. And, that, and that was what Roger pointed very strongly. And he was part of a movement generally. There were people like Alfred also died, David Watkin. And there were a number of people in the very early state, the early 70s. This all, I was, I mean, I was. So, I'll go on too much about this, but it was also the beginning of postmodernism. Postmodernism was an interesting phenomenon. Mm. When I was involved at that time, uh, for a moment it was the great hope. Mm. Somehow the people would learn from this. But what happened was it divided off. After the 1992 recession, um, uh, a lot of um, the, the modernists went back to mother modernism. Yeah. Uh, and one or two, and Thomas Gordon Smith's a very good example, unfortunately recently died as well, who actually did, that was an education to them that took them into classicism properly. Would you then argue that the, the people who went back to mother mo modernism, mother modernism, were those the least good in classical? No, I, I, wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't actually say that. I, I mean, I know these people very well, actually. <laughs> okay. And, um, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, the thing I have to remember is that much as we think their stuff is, is we shouldn't be doing it, these aren't bad people, they're just misguided people. Um, and they're misguided by, an, if you like, a process which you have described. Uh, I mean, Terry Farrell, for example, who really was one of the leading ones, actually he really did want to know about it, and he did. But what happened was, as he grew older, younger people in his firm, and he, he, he succumbed to the criticism of the profession. A lot of the profession were very, very cynical about it. Uh, and so he, he went, he, he, a lot of cases, Jeremy Dixon's another case. Um, these, were, these actually, in, in fairness to them, these were talented people. Um, and they wanted to know about it. They also, I remember a story, I remember in, being in Terry Farrell's office and watching a member of his staff do upside down balustrades. And I said, they're upside down. And they said, yes, I'm being very original. Oh, I said, they used to do that in the Baroque period. And um, he, he looked very crestfallen. <laughs> The, the reason I'm asking is, in a way, the future I'm afraid of is this kind of unity that architects who doesn't really know how to do it think they're classical. 
Oh, yeah, I agree. I'm 100% behind you on that. And, and what's interesting, of course, the, the Anglo Hebraic School, which now no longer exists, unfortunately. Um, but there's also one coming up in Cambridge. I'm starting one in Oxford. Um, there's a very oversubscribed program in the Netherlands. Um, uh, and there's also one in Belgium. Um, I mean, these, you know, this is like turning around a super tanker. You're not going to do it suddenly. Um, but you've got to keep what you do, and I'm, I'm lost in admiration, I have to say, you have to keep plugging away. You can never stand back. And good, sound, logical arguments are very, very difficult to argue against. I spent my career arguing against modernists, and it's so easy. I just wish they'd actually make it more difficult. Mm. And the debates would, then the debates would be more challenging. We'll open up for a questions from the, from the audience. Yes, please. Yes, I think that works. Can everyone hear him? I'll speak on this first. I mean, I've, I've with, along um, uh, with Peter here, Peter Olsen, I've come from, directly from a conference in Plessis Robinson, um, a, a satellite suburb of, or town, really, of Paris, where they transformed, it is remarkable, where the mayor transformed what was really a, a really seriously decaying banlieue into a really remarkable place where People, you can tell it, people love to live, they want to come there. This is, this is actually um, uh, a greater, you know, it, it's, it's increased densities of population. At the same time, it's very desirable. The, the, the principle, and I, say, I, I must be brief about this because I can go on for a very long time. The principle of, the, of the, what's happening in Britain at the moment is precisely that, is to, uh, is to actually produce codes for, for design that the community have helped to draw up, which are provably popular, and therefore the community will be involved, and therefore they are more likely to support development. Um, I think we recognize that this is a, a generational issue, um, because the idea that all development is bad is deeply locked into the, into the, in Britain, into the, into the public psyche. It, uh, it's, but it's not just, it's, I mean, it's very important that this is, is that the place you Robin is a good example. It's not just the architecture, it's the urbanism. You can achieve higher densities with good design. Um, you can make, you, you, all of this is possible. But there is also traditional urban design. Traditional urban design is more widely accepted at the moment as a phenomenon. Um, but in the end, Plessy Robin is a fantastic example where you have traditional urban design and you also have traditional buildings. And it, it's a charming, wonderful place. And to see what that was, and it is, is, is a good a demonstration as any of um, how successful that, that, that can be in improving and enhancing housing. Um, interestingly, and again, this is a, a political point, a lot of this is down to having powerful mayors with long periods of time in power. That's another story. There's a, there's a, whole, there's a very significant political aspect to this. One final question. Uh, I saw a hand here. Yes. Okay. A comment just a very, from just a very brief uh, comment uh, on the term you mentioned, uh, nimbyism, not in my backyardism. Uh, I recently interviewed uh, Audun Eng, who founded Intbau together with uh, Robert Adam and Peter Olsen, and he re he mentioned a very interesting uh, research that had been done that people are actually not in um, against. Uh, 
uh, building something in one's backyard or building something uh, more denser, as long as it is traditional architecture, then people are more willing to actually building uh, more dense, densely. And I found that really interesting because we have this notion today that people would definitely vote against denser architecture. So just wanted to mention that. Another fun thing, very short. There, there were, One more comment first, yes. Yeah, there, there, were, there were a lot in a city in the su uh, southern part of Sweden mm -hmm. and there was a company trying to build an office building and they have so much problem with the neighbors complaining so they actually gave up and sold the plot to a friend of mine who drew a classical building, and they got the building permits. And we talked to the city, and they were very surprised, because they were used to having like 200 letters of complaint on that lot. They got one. You know from whom? The city architect. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, final question. Okay, so I have two hands. I saw your hand first, yes. I'm sorry, but I, I have to stand up because this is an address to all of you, and you're, you ask for this. To be honest, if you're hungry and you're out in the street in Oslo and you see two restaurants, pick the one in the most beautiful building. Act how we think. Don't buy an apartment in an ugly building. Don't support businesses that produce bad architecture. Don't travel to cities with ugly things. Tend to act your life as you would like it to be. We're all power because we have money, we are in a democratic society, we can vote and we can act. We have to vote with our feet. What we act in society is the effect we will get from it. Don't buy these IKEA standardized things. Don't go to any like super standardized box for food or for furniture. Buy things that last. Buy one suit instead of ten. Buy something that actually matters to you. It's more resilient to everything. It's resilient to our society, of who we are as a people, of the environment. Everything that's made in a classical manner, made with hands, made for us, made for people. Just buy it. Talk about it. Do it. Don't fall for these simplistic, globalistic, standardized, one-use, throwaway things. Please, just act the way you wanted society to be. If one builds a modernist building and no one wants to buy the apartments, that sends a signal. If the neighbor builds a beautiful classical building and they sell out in one hour, that's a strong signal. We have to act the way we want things to be. Thank you. I will also say... I would also say, and I won't get much applause for this because it's obvious, um, is, is act politically. I mean, we, we, we all operate in systems which require permits and have control. Uh, and a lot of local politicians just roll over to the experts because it's too easy. I've seen it happen again and again. A lot of the people who manage these systems, city architects and so on, you know, they, 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 they belong to the honestly modern zeitgeist theory. Um, but in the end, if we're in a democratic society, if you get involved at that level and are prepared to speak out, uh, you will, you'll get power. So with that, Eric Norin, Carl Korsnes and Robert Adam, thank you so much for participating.